Hello, and welcome to the number one podcast in the world. Uh, you've tuned into X's and Uh O's, and um, I'm actually uh, sequestered somewhere because I've had a week from hell. And I'm so glad that I have a beautiful, wonderful Canadian icon to join me in, um, in, in this podcast today. And somebody's trying to text me. Hold on. It's just my drug dealer. Uh, no, it's all good. Um, so this week was really super interesting. I started this project, X's and Uh-Oh's, to see if you could actually get along with your ex. And I started it with good intention because I'm really, really curious about that. Um, can you actually do that in a meaningful way? And what does it mean? And I started on this journey and recorded about 13 episodes with my ex-husband that were magical and wonderful and deep and heartfelt and vulnerable and all these things that I never thought we would get to through this 12-step program that I came up with and asked the questions without um, any precursor. So it was a really, really fascinating experience. Well, what happened, George? I'm talking to you. We lost two episodes before it kind of all blew up. Um, so I'm on my own now. I'm on on my own. And what happened to me this week was sort of a media shitstorm that came my way. And this started 17 years ago when I was just a little girl from Canada and my husband left me and I got thrown into the media hounds. And it's been a real trajectory and a real learning experience. And I think that I handle it better now because I don't take it personally, but it certainly is painful. And there were some elements this week that were super, super difficult uh, to deal with. And so what I'm doing now is kind of processing it and figuring out what to do with it. And I know people want me to speak about it specifically, but um, I don't feel that I'm ready to. Um, so I have my my friend George here who's going to join me today. And he's pretty smart, right? He's pretty smart. You uh, are. I, um, I don't know about that, but I, I'm uh, worried about you. Are you okay? I I am okay. I'm just having a little cocktail. I'm in Palm Beach, <laughs> sequestered in a weird basement, George. And Listen, just I don't, uh, um, I, I don't want to gloss over that like um, like I'm enabling it. But if you are in control and you're okay, then I support you. One glass. Okay. Who's going to say anything about one glass? I've got the it's, French it's, chilling. It's nice to hear you again and nice to see you on this uh, this video chat. It's nice to see you too. Now, I want to go into all of this. We're going to talk about exes, nothing specific, because you're very strict with me about that. And I love your privacy and your discretion. But what I'd love you yeah, to do you, right yeah, when now. You text, when you texted me and asked me to come on the show, I was like, there's no way I'm going to go on. <laughs> <laughs> and you're here. here and here you're here. And it means what, so much I, to me. I didn't know what blew up. I didn't know what blew up. Oh, it blew up. It just—it's a shit storm. But listen, I've been in the eye of the storm before, and I'm—I'm—I'm going to weather it, and I'm—I'm I'm actually going to move with it and go with it and see what I learned through this trajectory that, that that I'm in right now. So I'm I'm open to everything. But before we get started with this, I would love you to tell our viewers how approximately 13 years ago you told me you were in love with me. Remember at that event that you watched What's for Dinner and you were madly in love with me? Remember oh, yeah. George? Do you That's remember right. that? I remember that. Yeah. I mean, I think that in love george you said in love yeah mm -hmm. right but because i i know that you're hyper smart and thoughtful and you also play with language you knew what i meant um but yeah i thought you were fantastic i thought you were fantastic and of course and i watched all the time um that was nice i don't even remember what the event was but i sure remember that conversation <laughs> do you remember that conversation well i was so shocked you were wearing eyeliner and i thought he's a very I, handsome man i was definitely you know you, you had just gotten off a tv thing that's why you had makeup on yeah I but i've never you, worn eyeliner on tv okay well you were never. just so naturally attractive my, no i know fine. these are my eyes. i've never worn eyeliner in my life i did once when i painted my whole whole face in corpse paint like uh like i was in a black metal band but that was like my whole face was painted but no okay maybe that was it okay it also could and, be that i just look so tired and strung out that what my natural dark circles appeared to be eyeliner. It could have been anemia. I'm not sure what it was, <laughs> but when we came together and had this conversation and you told me you loved my show and everything, oh, yeah. maybe I thought you said that you love me. Maybe you didn't say that, but I remember I went on your show and did stories we tell. Remember that little story thing you guys used to do yeah, on your show? Yeah. Oh, I remember. It was the best story ever. And you decided to tell that story. <laughs> it was like, when are you going to call me? Yeah, yeah. Anyway, no, no one played that for me, by the way, before it went to air. So I'm watching, I'm doing the show live to tape and they run that and I'm watching it thinking, oh, shit. <laughs> that was one of my finest moments. Your face was hysterical. Your audience went great. So it was so fun and it was so fun meeting you. And we've been trying to connect for over a decade. 
Um, and we finally got to today. So I've, I have so many things to ask you and, and talk to you I'm about. Grateful. And thank you. I'm grateful to your sister. I met your sister and we took a picture and and she and I, I, she reminded me that I had your the correct number. So I sent it to you. You did send it to me. And I was like, good Lord, yeah. Jesus, what a team. What a team. So this show is like called X's and uh O's. And, um, you know, can we, and this is a question from Mike, our producer, and I'm supposed to ask you, have you uh, stayed friends with your 12,482.5 X's? He thought that was kind of funny. That's very um, funny. But what's so interesting about you is you're such a private character. And obviously you've had, you know, a, a huge career in the media. And I was exposed to this through, I guess, you know, my marriage, my, uh, and my husband, ex-husband and mine just was everywhere. And yeah. you're the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Not what is your strategy, but are you friends with your exes? How do you handle that? How do you, how are you so discreet? I'm George? friends with, I'm friends with a lot of my exes, uh, not with all of them. I would be friends with all of them. I think some don't maybe want to be friends with me and that's okay, but I'm friends with a lot of them. And I would say this, that, uh, two of my closest friends in my life are exes and and maybe my greatest confidant is my ex and my longest uh relationship i had and it's certainly not easy to get to a place where you can be exes and friends and be and have clear lines and all that because we're humans and feelings and behaviors are amorphous but i if you put the work in and the other person is willing to put the work in and you have the stomach for the for the bubbles and the conflicts, if you can do that as you, you know, cause it really does feel like the bends. If you don't do it right, you have to ascend very Scuba carefully. Scuba diving term. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. yeah. You have to do that very carefully. And why do you think that is? Why do you think it is? I think because usually in a situation it's never, there are nothing's equal, right? There's no, everybody remembers a, a moment differently everybody experienced a fight differently everybody experienced the joy differently so it's not like you both had the same experience and so what ends up happening is you apply your your experience uh and your you you run everything through the filter of your experience and the assumption is that the person had a similar experience in the relationship but they didn't because they were going through their own things and you know we have all this language and these tools now where people talk about oh my trauma and oh my parents and oh this well when in the 90s i never heard that shit i didn't know we didn't know no. that shit, right so no. we were just, and we also we were young right so we're all just trying to figure our way out so i became uh, hyper aware of the fact that everybody experiences everything differently and even though you can look at some of their experiences and say that is categorically not how it happened meaning you know we didn't we didn't break up that way we didn't you know whatever it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how you remembered it. What matters is, can you come to an understanding of how each other experienced it? And so that to me uh, became a realization. And I put a lot of work into that uh, as a human being. So I could be a little bit more present and a little bit more understanding and a little bit more uh, connected to what their experience might be, as opposed to trying to tell them what their experience was. Not that I was doing that, but I think every human being does that. And I, I, I just wanted to be better and lovelier and also on a real you know mary joe if if the only thing that really matters is time that's the only thing that you can't really buy more of with the exception of if you have enough money you can buy the current time you have but you can't really get more time obviously um what a waste it would be to spend that much amount of time with somebody and and not have them in your life now now sometimes you have to because they're toxic and whatever sometimes you're the toxic one and you don't know it right did you point at me I pointed at whoever's listening, whoever's listening. <laughs> okay, go um, on. And we all have, well, no, we all have shitty behavior and good behavior, but I decided that I was going to do as much as I could to keep great people in my life and try to make sure that I was one of those people they wanted to keep in. Sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't work. And a big part of that is just calling yourself on your own bullshit and recognizing your behavior. Right. And it's, you know, through your prism of what you see, you know, it's interesting. So through your, what you're looking at in your relationship, what you perceive as angered for the other person could be who knows like intimacy yeah. or frustration like you have these completely you know different uh different emotions that just aren't and it's through your experience it's through your personal experience what you bring to it you know and your and your family history and and your brain chemistry which i think we don't give enough uh credence to you you know not everybody's wired to handle things 
the same way, even if you tell them what you think is a better way. Not that I was that kind of guy, hopefully. The other thing is that, and I experienced this early in my career, I saw it happen to you and I saw it with him and I, and I played hockey with Dean, I love him, right? And I, 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 I've seen this with other people is that when you date somebody and you're in some version of the public eye, and then when you're no longer with them, for lots of reasons, their choice, your choice, what you don't put out press releases. So what ends up happening is every time they see somebody, they ask about, hey, what's going on with so-and-so? Right, right, right. So I decided a long, long time ago in my 20s that I was going to be hyper private and discreet, mostly to protect the healing that we have to go through and we're with somebody. But also I chose this career. So I chose to be in the public eye. They didn't. So they're not, they shouldn't be subject to the insanity of, of, of the public's response. So I just didn't, I didn't want anybody to be involved. So that's why I became hyper, hyper private. Somebody interviewed me a long time ago and said, how come I don't know anything about your personal life? And I said, because I don't talk about it, but I mean, I'll talk about like lots of stuff, motorcycle, riding, camping, all this shit. Right, 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 but, right. But I don't, I don't want to be the guy that is like, oh, this is my girlfriend now. And oh, this was my girlfriend. And like, that's not part of the narrative. I don't think, I don't think that when you're an interviewer, you should be the story, right? You shouldn't be the person because it should be your ability to draw stuff out of people, not yourself. Right, right. Like a good photographer who just catches the image yeah. um, and isn't and isn't invested. It, it, it's interesting because I never uh, certainly chose to have anything this public. So yeah. I've had a learning curve, a very steep learning curve. And I'm sure you've had it on some level too. Like we all, you know, fuck up, make mistakes. And, and all of a sudden it's like public fodder, you know, um, and it can yeah. just be something, it can just be a misstep that people do. And then, you know, the other thing that we've been talking about lately too, is just when you get into the media treadmill, and you, we all know how it works. Like we know the sources, the phone calls, like the money exchanged and how the narrative is written. And I, I guess for me, it was so odd to have the narrative written, but it had nothing to do with who I was and my life or anything. So it's kind of resurfaced 17 years later, but I'm really interested in examining it and, and learning it. I think I'm better prepared this time, you know, to, to handle it. I really don't so, really care that much what people think I just, people who I love that's what I care about you know that's the most important thing but it's a hard thing to get um you can't be trained in it you can, until you go, go through it I don't know if you had anything major I know you had the hockey night in Canada and I I think you were publicly fired or you were fired or whatever happened like so and you're such a um a Canadian and you love your hockey and all that stuff so how was that for you because you've really controlled your career really yeah. really well you know, I knew that show wasn't going to last that way. I knew that when they hired me, they said they wanted to do a thing and I knew they didn't have the stomach for it. Um, but I just thought, what the hell, let's go get it. The one thing that I, I have always been is fearless. And um, I thought, how cool would this be to close the chapter as a host in Canada this way? I knew it wasn't going to work. I knew the chances were low, but then the guy who hired me left. So I really knew it was it was low. Um but I didn't mind. I also felt like I had done everything I could do as a host. And this was a reset. And I'm a really big fan of blowing things up. And look, now I have a show that's bigger than that. Like now the show that I do is in 165 countries. And I'm I'm so grateful that my career keeps going in a way. But it's because I stick to my convictions, right? And I have right. them in the first place. Right. Hockey, I was told when I was a host of hockey, this is what they told me, was that the ratings were going, by the people who ended up getting rid of me, were that you know the ratings were going up with people under thirty and with women. We were opening the show up. We were we were right. doing what I was supposed to do, but what ends up happening is most people aren't in the in our industry are not progressive and don't see the value of it. That's why you can see not just, I'm not talking about that show, but you can see sports media in general absolutely panicked when real world issues started to happen last year. They were completely ill-equipped for the conversation because they don't have these conversations. They're myamic, my, or myopic cable sports guys. And that's fine. There's room for that. But they just weren't prepared for where the culture was going. And I, I was trying to get them prepared for that, at least during my part. I wasn't the only one. There were lots of people in there that were. But that's just ultimately not where they wanted to go. And I'm fine with that. And I think the key is to understand the assignment. What's the assignment? And then decide if the assignment changes, decide if you want to continue with that assignment. 
I don't grieve anything that didn't exist. I don't grieve Actually, relationships that weren't there. I don't grieve jobs that didn't really exist. They're just ideas and you make the next one. I totally 100% agree with that completely. Like every failure, every every shit storm, everything that's happened in the last 24 hours, everything that's happened in the the last 10 years, every failure, every stumble, I'm into it now. I, you know, I used to be terrified of this stuff or anything negative. And now I'm like, kind of bring it on because it's like well, a little irritant in a clam. Like, you know, it's going to What's the negative make... stuff. Like what's the negative stuff Did you like do something ridiculous? Oh no, 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 no. It's just, it's just over the course of the last two decades, even when I did what's for dinner, you know, right. I used to get mail from guys in prison you know, well, actually they liked me. They would make me like potato peelers and, yeah. you know, weird vibrators and stuff. But then I would get stuff from women, like, yeah. or men, like we want to take you out in the porch and blow your brains out. You're so obnoxious. So I've uh-huh. always, I mean, you know, you too, like we always get this stuff. And I so you get, get a little- letters, I used to get letters from dudes in prison. Gym. I used to get letters from dudes in prison. They were requesting metal videos when I was working at Much. They were my favorite <laughs> letters to get. They were my favorite letters to get. I still have my potato peeler and which led me to the question is how can they be making a potato peeler in prison? Like, couldn't they escape with a potato peeler? Like it was metal. Anyway, you know, I had a collection of them. Um, But I I also think in life, like failures in relationships and friendships and all this stuff, because we're both 50 and over. I'm just barely 50 and over. I think you just turned 50 around that. But, you know, but it's like everything is a, a learning experience. And I guess it's just like not attaching good or bad to it just okay this is what's happening and this is i'm gonna i'm gonna learn something from this shit if it kills me yeah you know? and, and look we we're the last era where being famous we're the last era that was fame and fame is a bullshit word but had profile in a platform we're the last era of those who had that before social media because we also right. had it during social media which we have now but we're right. the last one who experienced it where like people were always saying good and bad things about us anyway just now we had a chance to hear more of it and i don't think the human brain is equipped for that and it's not equipped especially when you knew that a lot of these social media companies were actively working algorithms that would rewire algorithms yeah they rewire your brain. rewire your brain and to actually put you into fright and anxiety and flight mode and all yeah. this stuff to purchase more shit basically yeah we're the first um, group we're the first group that had to do that in the public eye like no one's had now people like i i i don't laugh but i kind of laugh in my punk metal way when people say social media makes them feel badly about themselves i'm like what don't let anybody have any fucking power over you like when I see somebody on social media who's in better shape, I, you know, I'll get the fitness things come on my thing and I'll see yeah. some dude in way better shape than I am. And I'm always like, I'm proud of you, man. Go for it. Because I made the choice to eat the potato chips. So I know what I fucking did. Right? With so, dip maybe, with a little yeah, dip, yeah. some beer, a little beer. No, no, yeah, vegan dip and a non-alcoholic beer for sure. I'll take those calories. So I, so I, I don't let... Like people are now going, oh my God, the presence of but, somebody else. But means- you're an adjusted, you're an adjusted 50 year old male. Okay. Yeah. In a privileged position. You know, if you're, if you're talking about 12, 13, 14 year old girls in this, no, in this universe. Adult. Yeah. Yeah. But still, adult. yeah. Yeah. But I'm it's so sick and so warped. And I know that if I was at, you know, like 14, 15, 16, even sometimes I look at stuff, go, oh my God, you know, you have like a fear of missing out or it's so you're, it's like an onslaught of what you should be doing and what you yeah. should look like, you know, but and curating different. your life. Yeah, but it's isolating. It's I'm isolating. About, I'm talking about adults. So like adults cannot let like we cannot let somebody else's success, whether we know it's real or not, make us feel badly about ourselves. That is a that is a personal thing that we have to deal with. We can sit there and talk all we want about everything else connected to it, but we know that I guess because I grew up in a neighborhood and in an era where I never believed that the media was on my side. I never believed that the police or the church or the school or the government was on our side. So when everybody now feels shocked by, oh my God, what's happened? I never grew up thinking any of this stuff was on my side. So when I saw social media doing what it turned turning into what it turned into it none of it surprised me it's always been that way in fact it's a that's little your bit, experience yeah, that's your experience obvious. yeah that's your prism coming from it but people who i mean anyway life is so complicated and um and there's so much coming at everybody right now to to do the inner work as cliche as it sounds to get to the point where you can take the hits you know it's yeah. it's 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 work it's you're just you're not born with it you don't walk with it you have to earn it you know so yeah. it's a very it's very interesting i remember when i was younger when i would call people on the phone i would do my best work for hours like i'm like this is i could go for hours and hours on the phone and just the sound of somebody's voice and that communication 
we'd look forward to those calls, right? Because we'd learn and create and have interaction and connection. And um, now so I won't answer a call. And now I won't even answer a call. Like I know now, we're too scared. Just text me. Just text me. That's the only way to reach me. But no, what I'm I mean, what, what I sort of think is, that, is that you have to like, there are lots of systemic reasons, class war reasons why things are so busted. And they're intentionally, divided. I guess they're, they're busted against us for this reason. It's on purpose. But my thing is that at some point I had to take control of how I was going to react to well, things. That's exactly. Yeah. And that's it. So it's, I'm not responsible for what it is, but I, I do have to be responsible for how I react to something because my reactions and my behaviors will tell my subconscious what I want me to be. And I didn't want that. So I needed to take control over my subconscious uh, by putting some work into it, right? I needed to put some work into it so I could be less swayed by things like Hockey Night in Canada, as well adjusted as I am. It was hard to get pummeled every day, especially when I knew that the reporters were not telling the real story and that I, they were just throwing me to the wolves. I knew that. I, reporters yes. would come to me. Reporters would come to me and say, hey, did you know that this is what so-and-so at Hockey Night is saying? And, and, I, and I was like, why don't you? Because most of the media in Canada was especially in sports and entertainment is kind of, you know, they're just, they're not, they're not doing journalism, right? They're doing reportage and that's not always the same thing. And so, you know, they were all trying, and I was told by reporters, look, we don't want to say anything that will get us to lose our jobs. We're like, okay. Okay. Well, so, you're such an anomaly. You were such an anomaly in, in oh, Canada no. in that profession. I mean, this was like, you know, I mean, they would have no idea how to to handle you, how to how to interview, how to let you have that transition into something different. Like that is iconic, archaic, you know, like what you were in fun, charge man. of. It was so fun. Oh, I'm sure you had the, I'm sure like you had a boner yeah. the whole time. You were doing hockey. <laughs> you were talking about stuff you liked. You could play yeah. your music. I mean, my my goal in life was actually to be an NFL football coach. I'm like a sports fanatic. I love sports. Not so much hockey. Still sorry. You still sorry? can. You still can. I could with my wheelchair on the side, my geriatric. Well, I love it. I'm obsessed with it. I love it. I love it. I love it. But it was a very brave thing uh, for you to do. And um, I love what you said about your access. Obviously, you've done the work, which is wonderful. And when I think of you, I told you this in the text to force you to come on the show. I said, you and Dan Levy are very similar to me in the way you curate your social media and your presence. And um, you're both so authentic and Canadian. You've got this just lovely Canadian tone to it. But I'm interested in seeing what you're up to because of exactly what you said. It's coming just from such a place of like, no bullshit. This is how I'm living my life. And it's really refreshing. You, I you, really like it. Well, thank you. You know, you have this thing where you, in your mind, you have the person you think you are, right? And then if you just take a little step back, you can see the person you actually are. The one that the, your behavior and-, and Oh, and pick it, me for one second. And if the divide is too big, it is the most I, painful- realization in the world right right and so what you yeah. have to decide is which guy are you going to move which person are you going to move am i going to become more like the person i am or more like the person i think i am and so i decided that i was going to be more like the person i wanted to be and you can't do that without actual work without actual accountability it, that doesn't mean go on an apology tour because not everybody wants that. It's 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 it, not that I had to go on an apology tour, but it was more like, hey, I have to really be more conscientious about maybe what I do and how I do it, and it's not an overnight fix. It's and it why? Is, why did you want that? I think, I think to be lovely is the greatest goal of all. I think how people. How that's you, grace. That's grace. That's uh, grace. And yeah. to help and to and to make sure that no matter, like it's never a hundred percent because some people are just fuckers and they need it, but to, they need to be taken down. But for the most part, you want people who are in your company to not just feel like they matter to you, but they have to matter to you, even if you don't know them. Everybody has to matter because it's your interaction with somebody um, can have an impact on the rest of their day, and you just cannot be the wind against their faces. You gotta be the wind beneath their wings. And I really, so I felt like, I, I mean, I always felt like that's who I was trying to be. Um, and I felt like I did it, you know, with a reasonable or, you know, success or failure, I was aiming for it. And I just- Well, that's letting go of ego. That's definitely letting go of some perception of of what you were and, yeah, and letting matter. go. Because it doesn't matter, You're right? Who you are doesn't right. matter. What really matters is how you make people feel. And, and, right. and as a result- Maya Angelou, Maya Angelou, of course. 
You know, I, I was so lucky. I went to her house um, a few months before she passed and we uh, we did an interview in her house and she was singing to me and we were, she loved my Greek last name because she was, she kept hers when she married then. And, and we, she, she said something to me that she has said elsewhere, but she said that whenever she has to do something, she brings everybody who was ever kind to her, everybody she's ever loved, she brings them with her whether they're alive or, or, or gone, she says, wow. she's like, I need you to come with me now. Let's they're go. angels. They're, yeah. yeah. We, they're, and, and everybody who is ever kind to her comes with her. And I thought, Lord have mercy. We should be, we should be part of everybody's army if they need us. Right. And, and, yeah. it's, and it's an active choice to be there. And I'm not like, I'm not spiritual. I'm not religious. I don't give a shit about any of that stuff. In fact, I'm rather, I'm rather anti a lot of it, you know. I think its its legacy of brutality is well documented, but there are elements of of real gangster Buddhism that I really get behind, which yeah. is the removal of the self. And and you got to work hard at it, especially because people like you and I have had cameras or microphones in front of us for a long time, and so you can't help but be defined by the job and how people see you. And you just have to work hard to break that shit. It's actually impossible work. Like some days it actually feels like, are you fucking kidding me? And then when you actually hit your sweet spot, and I look at it this way, like spirituality is energy. It's almost like quantum physics. It's like the energy you put out, like the energy you connect to, like what she said, I'm connecting to kindness. So what I'm going to bring with me today is kindness. And if you're, if you're being kind, you're in love. You can't be in fear or anger and anything. I mean, you are bringing that energy with you. And it's like what you put out is what you get back. It's kind of, it's a spiritual law. It's as simple as it gets, right? Yeah. I mean, it's really, really simple. Fear and anger are really important and you'll have them, but they're not, they're not places of being. They're just feelings. So you have to, now, sometimes you need them. That's why they exist. Sometimes you should be afraid. Get out of that room. Sometimes you should be angry um, and so and fight for the things that you're- Our caveman. About. But when you reside in it permanently, like yeah, yeah, our that, culture is, it's a kind yeah. of a problem. Yeah, that's It's, it's pure problem. anger and lashing out and, and everything like that. And the other thing that um, I thought was interesting about you, and I just wanted to touch on this with you, um, and then I'll ask you one more next question, but that's it. Um, and I do see parallels, and this is like the biggest compliment I'm going to give you between you and the man I loved and was supposed to marry and pined for for years and years and years was Anthony Bourdain. I'm obsessed with Anthony Bourdain. Always have been. You were supposed to marry him? <laughs> I was supposed to marry him. He yeah. did not know that because I'm so his type, tall, blonde. You yeah. know, I'm, I'm, re I'm really in his wheelhouse. But, you know, I became a chef because of Kitchen Confidential in the 90s and just Anthony loved his was, ethos, his he ethics. Really, he was really lovely. He was really interesting. And um, so broken. Yeah. so broken but his, and, his we used to message each other regularly and he of he, course he, he did you know he came on my show a long time ago and i think we both saw that we had a lot of similar interests and similar motivating factors and i think that was key um we weren't pals by like we weren't close by any means but we were in touch did and, my name come up ever like mary joe you I'm know watching what? what's for he, dinner he was probably too smart to put it in writing so he may have intimated but he just didn't name it Right. I knew it. I knew it. But so yeah, here, no. George, here's something about him that's really interesting. Sorry to interrupt. Is We all know his demise and what happened and everything, which is so tragic. But what I felt with him, and, and tell me if you felt this, it's what you're talking about. Like I felt he had such an image of who he was or who he had to be to the world that was not real. Like It was concocted and very successful for him. And then it seemed like that there was other this other part of him that was so far away from that. There was such a divide between his personality, like just so shy. And I, there was something so broken in between, but he could turn it on, I guess, until he couldn't. But it just seemed he really didn't have a connection with himself. Maybe I'm- Well, I, I felt like maybe he did, but, um, but, but what I think- I think what Anthony was was the full complement of a human being, right? And and he was the he was the he was kind of the sharp end of the sword um in every aspect. So that's your wins and your losses and you hope to win more than you lose on a given day and survive that day and not everybody gets to do that. Um I feel like Anthony was complex but no more complex than anybody else. What Anthony did really well I thought what I loved about Tony was um and this is what I've tried to do my whole career is, is be curious and shine a light on the dignity of others. 
he used uh, food as the starting point. I used music. Um, but it was really about we all come together to have an, a common understanding. I understand how divided we are. Not every divide will be bridged. I get that. But we do have an awful lot in common as human beings, and we do. We are all sort of subject to the same oppressions that the that the capitalist, the class war system has put on us. Um, but Tony never lost that, that plot. But look, that's the thing. At the end of the day, addiction is addiction's a fucker. And no, addiction is a fucker. But he was depression. stone cold sober when he did it, which is well, the most sad thing in the world to me i think that he you know with his travels and when i was been thinking about it you know uh traveling all that time all like 280 300 days a year first of all your brain chemistry is going to be fucked you're going to be crazed you're in so many different time zones all these experiences i mean you know from the congo to bhutan like all this stuff that he did and i think all that travel and information that he had i think it made him sad the what, state what, of the world made him sad his last message to me was really sad and I tried to get a hold of him and I didn't hear from him after that. And then oh. it was gone not that long after he, yeah. uh, uh, but again, I, I think, you know, we, we know this, we have the language now that we didn't have when we were younger, but mental health ad addiction is mental health, depression, all these things. And especially for men, the statistics are it, it, a bad 20 minutes and you make a bad decision like for for women i think the statistics are these kinds of decisions happen over a longer period of time a couple of days often where with men statistically it's a much shorter time frame where we go down the wrong road and and you don't survive that all the time rarely actually and so yeah so i don't i don't know like i travel all the time and i love it and i know that tony did too and he loved it but you can catch a bad break man and 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 if you and old fucking dragons they, you know, they come up from the from the earth and you're done. And it's really, really challenging. You know, we lost a couple of people in the last few years that way. Uh, you know, another guy that I was a really big fan of was in a rock and roll band. And yeah, the Foo Fighter off. guy. Well, Foo Taylor, Fighters. but also Riley from Power Trip. And it just goes wrong. And now I don't I don't know the Taylor story. Like, I don't I, yeah. I don't know what I've read. But, you know, with other people, it just creeps up on you. And that's why talking about it and talking about well, I think that's why it's so fascinating to talk about him. We're all sort of obsessed with him because everybody thought he had the most perfect job in the world. But of course, it was probably the most lonely and the, the most isolating. And, you know, I always thought just in your thoughts on this, because I think it goes to your point, that 20 minutes where it just goes south and you're like, can't hold on. Because who would ever do that on the set of their show with their crew? Like, that's how desperate he must have been and how sad. And, you know, I mean, it it's just yeah. you couldn't I overcome it. Could yeah, I, I don't know all the details of that. You know, the truth is I kind of intentionally stayed away from them because they wouldn't matter to me any, anyway. It was just kind of like he's gone. You know, and another friend of mine, Michael Kenneth Williams, same thing, bad moment, boom, gone. Now, I don't know if that wasn't on purpose, but it, these things, they're accidental, they're on purpose, they're bad mixes. There's all these things that can take somebody down in a second. And um, I've been uh, straight edge now for 28 years. Um, Does that mean no drinking, no drugs? Is that just so it's straight edge? It's not sober. It's called straight edge. Yeah. Cause I'm not, I, I quit before I, I didn't go into a program. Right. So, okay. I, yeah. but I, I could see how quickly it could sneak up on you, you know, and I don't want to, and I'm a pretty fearless fighting kind of guy and I could get myself into trouble and I didn't want to do that, but I could see how quickly, cause even I creeps up in my head from time to time and you, you, you have to kind of keep some behaviors at bay um or or you what? can or you can get into trouble you know you can heroin's into... a tough one heroin's not heroin like if you can have an addiction like that that's oh, as, yeah. oh, as yeah. deep as it goes yeah. so question do you any, have a... just to be clear i don't have any ideation i don't have any of that that's not what no I'm no talking. no you don't seem to not with that I don't fabulous have... hair everything no, you <laughs> seem, good to me. You seem good to me so question do you have a fabulous mom i just sense you must are you, do you have a close relationship with your mom? Did you have a great female role model growing up or did you get that later? Raised, in life? I was raised by a single mom and um, yeah. yeah, my mom is uh, the most gangster missionary. My mom, the way, the way I describe her, Mary Jo, is my mom is the wilderness. My mom is the wilderness and I could not have been given a better stroke of luck from this universe than to have her as my mother we don't agree on everything we have completely different political points of view she's hyper religious we have 
very little in practice in common, but the love and tenderness between the two of us is for the ages. Uh, yeah. people, people could write sonnets about the relationship I have with my mother. Um, she is, my mother taught me, I don't even know how she fucking did it, man. She was, she was a teenager, I think, when she got knocked up. My dad split in her mid-20s, and she was alone raising two kids by herself. We grew up way below the poverty line, and we, my mom, somehow, I don't know how she did it. Like, I have no idea. You know what she did? She did this crazy thing where she drew... She took one of my, I used to steal movie posters and she used to take the, took this movie poster and she wrote a poem on the back of it and she stuck it to the, the, the inside of the front door of my home. And as a teenager, she wouldn't let me leave the house until I recited it out loud. <laughs> oh, that's gangster bitch. I love I, that. I had to recite wow. it out loud. It a poem about accountability. And so she said, you can go out there and do what you want, but if you end up in jail, don't call me because chances are you did it and I'm not here to bail you out. You are grown, grown up to do the shit and you pay for it. So my mom, the, my mom said to me, I'm not your friend. It's not my job to be your friend. It's my job to get you to a place where you are at. You live a good life and how you treat people matters. So I'm giving all the tools to not fuck up. If you fuck up by choice, See you later. Out. See you yeah, later. And I'm so I'm so grateful that I know that there are people who find that problematic, but I don't because I find it, it powerful. Really, I find it, really it powerful. MJ, it saved me because there were moments where I was about to do things and that poem was popping in my head. So I stopped. It actually changed my behavior. And so so to this day, like my mom doesn't know most of what's happened in my life or what I've done, but she she <laughs> and she doesn't want to. She loves me. I love her immensely. She is the wilderness. And and I, I I've got a video I found of her riding a motorcycle, like a little kid's motorcycle in her neighborhood in the rain with no helmet as fast as she can because my mom loves the freedom. My mom's a big freedom chick, which is weird for a super Christian, but she's a super Christian who loves her freedom. And uh, and I just my mom doesn't have a cell phone doesn't have the internet, has never had internet, has never sent an email, doesn't have Wi-Fi. My mom refuses to be on the grid and to be tracked. So and she's badass. So she uses this organ. This yeah, organ's yeah, really important all, to your, brain and to your mom. Yeah, and so I'm I, clearly my mother's son, clearly. I love the accountability because nobody takes accountability for anything. We're like, what? What do we do? Like, I love actually taking accountability. And when you say your mom's a wilderness, yeah, do you mean she's like, what do you mean by that? like just empty and open and scary or or liberation or what does that mean when you say i love that expression your mom's a wilderness my mom is a beautiful example of all the elements of nature at work my mom is holistically her my mom understands uh the impact of choices my mom understands the impact of her choices my mom is the wilderness in that she cannot be tamed. My mom is not hearing anything from anybody except for what is her her pure nature. Now she calls me a natural man because I'm not a uh, I'm not a believer. She is a spiritual woman, but she. So I describe her as the wilderness, and she does not uh, enjoy that description. But I tell her she's wild. She can't be tamed. But she works in harmony with everything else around her. And that is what is incredible about this woman to me is that for a woman who believes in something that is not of this earth, she is so very of this earth. She is so very harmonious. She is so very connected. She is Curious. My, yeah, she's like, you know, my mom is like that, like the old growth tree that through carbon passes down wisdom and best practices to everything else in the forest. She provides a canopy for everything to grow under her. That's who my mom is. And I knew I, it. I, I knew have, it. I have people who have stopped me on the street. This is true. I, this gentleman stopped me in the street. He goes, Hey, you're George. I'm like, yeah. He said, I know your mom. I said, Oh, cool. How do you know my mom? He says, well, I used to be homeless. It was his word. I used to be homeless. And I, I asked her for some money one day. She wouldn't give me money. She instead went and bought me a sandwich she bought herself a sandwich. She ate the sandwich with me. She then moved me into her house where I lived till I got my shit together. Anyway, this is my wife and kids now. And I wouldn't have this if I didn't live in your mother's house. And I said to him, when did you live in my mother's house? And he said, you know, like eight years ago, how long did you live in my mother's house? I don't know, for like a year and a half or something. He went, you fucking lived in my mother's house. My mother never told me. 
She didn't tell anybody. Like my mom, yeah. is, that's my old lady. And so that's who she is. My mom like actually puts her money where her mouth is in the biggest way. Didn't have a lot of money, but my mom, like that's the wilderness. That is making sure that she actually did that shit. And she does it. That's happened to me more than once where people have stopped me to talk about my mom. And I, I love it. Nothing makes me happier. And my mom goes, she is a thug, man. <laughs> <laughs> That's so interesting because my aunt, I had a, 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 my aunt Sue is my mother's sister, started out of the cold in Canada. So she started it like 40 or 50 years ago. And, you know, all the priests gave her a hard time and like the patriarchy. And she's like, screw this shit. I started cooking for her when I was 12 or 13. Same deal. We'd go down the street and they, you know, that she'd see somebody homeless or, and, and they'd ask for money and she'd go, no, come to Starbucks with me. I mean, she was upscale. Come to Starbucks with me. I'll get you your spinach frittata and a latte and I'm not giving you money for drugs, but I'll meet you here every day. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll buy you lunch and, and I'll help you, but I'm not, I'm not going to do that. And having like that, the, those types of role models, like is just, you can see it in, in your DNA that, you know, it was absolutely instrumental. She modeled really amazing behavior for me. And she, she, it, it was, my mom used to say, what you say is important, but what you do is also important. So both those things have to be intentional. And which, which blows my mind that she was 20, whatever, five, two kids, she was a cocktail waitress and then she wake up in the morning to deliver newspapers. She worked in a, in this greasy spoon Greek restaurant. She's Ukrainian, but all, my mom, you know, was banging, right? She looked great. And so she would, the, the, the Greek men in this restaurant that she worked at, it wasn't just the fact that they were Greek, but they were, it was a Greek restaurant. And they would say such really insulting things, sexual gross things about my mom not knowing that my mom knows how to Could understand to she understood so at one point she said that to them and they fucking stopped that was the end <laughs> of that shit you cannot my mom is a force right and so my mom was subject to an awful lot of the indignities of being treated terribly because you're poor you are an immigrant and you are a woman and yeah. uh, my mom never once never once even though all that was true she said to me, the cavalry ain't coming. So we, we, you do need to go work on the systems, but in the meantime, you have to, you have to affect the change in your own life now. And that was, this is what a lot of my, so I call them the CBC, the academic left don't understand about people who are street left wing, which is that there are, there's, there's more than just systemic things. That yes. They'll do it. Yes. But, yeah. but on the ground right now, shit's on fire for people, especially immigrants. This is when I was growing up. And you just had to take control as, as much as you could. And so my mom was get hardcore street left. And well, I, it goes back to it goes back to what you were talking about accountability. I mean, on on any level, you have to take accountability for your situation and make the changes. And 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 if it's ugly or complicated, you know, what what are you left with? Like you have to make those choices. And it sounds choices. like obviously your mom your mom did and could and didn't just knew intuitively that I have to get this shit done. Yeah, you know, and I. I True, very, but, very um, uh, uh, micro, right? Not macro, micro. Yeah, very, very micro. micro. And, and here's what I will yeah. say. This. What I learned from uh, as I got older, which was to compliment how my mother raised me, was because it was challenging for us does not mean that I expect everyone else to do it that way. It is now my job to use my position to try to clear a path so that other people don't have to just do the micro. Like my job when I got a TV show was to fight for the macro as well. So yeah. I don't want people to have to go through um, um, what I went through or, and, uh, you know, you know, or whatever, things like that. So, so I believed firmly in how I experienced my upbringing worked for me. But that does not mean everybody else has to go through this. It goes right back to the beginning of our conversation, talking about exes and your 13,576 exes that you right. get along with most of them. I mean, you say that number, but no one's ever heard of any of them. So. No, 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 no. I'm just, I'm teasing you gently. I know, I know, I know, I'm teasing I know. you gently. But what know, you said at the beginning of this podcast, which was really interesting, is that through my prism of, of yeah. what a relationship is, both people are coming it in, coming in with their different, you know, perception of what's going on and how you see things differently. And, you know, to rectify that or, or to come to terms with that or be friends with that, it can be really complex because you're really both complex. coming at it. And, you know, it circles back to your mom and, and being accountable, which circles back to she raised a good guy who actually thinks about these things and 
and has integrity and as you said wants to be lovely and i love that word because it's respectful and it's gracious and it's kind and it's it's gentle and it's so she a, did a good job she did a I, good job I, I am not anywhere near the person i am without my mom like there is no scenario where where i i am this guy without my mom my mom taught me that and i know it sounds so stupid and so fucking easy but it's true is that love in the home is the most important thing but love doesn't always mean what you think it means like to me so love didn't mean blind support love didn't mean um it meant kicking your ass probably love was kicking yeah. your ass yeah so you love, didn't end up somewhere horrible yeah love wasn't a state of being love was an act and what she never she never vocalized this but i saw her function do it that love was exactly it, a verb. It was an action. It yeah. was a thing you had to do. I have not always been good at it. I, I I got into this rhythm, you know, maybe when I was about 27 or 28, where just doing, a, I've been doing a daily show for almost 30 years, right? For, I think 26 of the 32 years I've doing this for a living. And you get into this momentum of a daily show and you are inadvertently reckless with people emotionally because you're not present. And you don't know you're doing that because you're just trying to get a show to air every day. And at some point I realized, oh, that's shit. I got to change, you know, maybe, maybe 10 or so years ago, I, I was like, ah, I'm not, I'm not nearly as present or as intentional. Well, I think that was Anthony Bourdain to a certain extent, aside from his addiction, that it was too much of a, a shiny object, the traveling in the show. I mean, there was no anchor, right? There was no personal, I personal anchor. I always thought he had it. I always, I don't know what, yeah, I thought, I didn't know that he didn't have the anchor. I thought he had the anchor. I mean, I yeah. have the anchor. The anchor is, the anchor is my joy for life. That's my anchor. So nothing. That's what I was going to say to you. I was going to say you're a joyful person. I could talk to you for another 10 days because you're really fascinating and you're kind of cute and your hair is good. Now, when you're in LA, maybe we can go for coffee or something and continue where, the conversation in, in person. Where are you? I'm in a bunker somewhere in Palm Beach. Don't ask, but I will be home shortly. I will be back next week. Why are you in a bunker? I don't want to talk about Okay. <laughs> no, I just, I'm okay. just here, but I've, I have loved talking to you. I just, I, I really think what you're doing is super cool. And I love your story about your mom. And I just think that it resonates in you. So she did a great job. So thank you so much for joining us today on X's and O's. You made me feel better. You made me feel better. So I super, super appreciate it, but good luck with everything. I know you have a million okay. things on the go, but you're super wonderful. You too. It's really nice to see you again. Thank you so much. Nice to see you too. Bye, thanks, Mike. Bye-bye. Bye, Mike. Bye. Bye. See you.